Welcome to APTN National News, I'm Dennis Ward. Families, friends and supporters of the four First Nations women killed by a serial killer in Winnipeg are in court at this hour, sharing their impact statements with the judge that found Jeremy Skibitsky guilty of four first degree murder charges back on July 11th. T.R. Wheatley has been following the trial in the spring of 2022. Skibitsky killed Rebecca Contois, Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, and Mushkode Bizhike Ikwe, or Buffalo Woman. TR joins us live from outside the courtroom now, and a warning, there may be some distressing details here. Uh, TR, good to see you. Uh, what have you heard so far? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Moments ago when I came out of the courtroom, uh, Rebecca Contois' mother, Marie, was doing her impact statement. Uh, before her, there was uh, her sisters who also did their impact statements. Um, you know, when I was leaving, Rebecca, Rebecca Contois' mom, she had to stop and somebody, one of her supporters had to pick, pick up um, that statement and read it for her because it was pretty emotional. Uh, you know, before that, we heard from Grand Chief Kathy Merrick of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, and she basically talked about, you know, the impacts this had on the community as well. We heard from Sandra Delleron, who we told you about um, a couple of weeks ago, who was gathering impact statements. Uh, so, so, so that's who we have heard from so far this morning. Yeah, emotional day, no doubt, down there, uh, TR. Can you kind of set the scene inside for those of us who aren't there? Yeah, so inside, um, you know, where, where this trial is taking place or has taken place rather is the biggest, uh, largest courtroom in the building, actually the largest in Manitoba. It has about 101 seats in the gallery and, you know, all those seats were full with families, supporters, community members, um, you know, and it still wasn't enough. Some people had to get turned away. Us as media, we were put in the jury box, one of the jury boxes on the side. Um, and across from us, in the other jury box, many of the Winnipeg police officers who, who you know, um, were involved in this, they, they sat there as well as other court people from the court. And as you could actually hear and probably see behind me, you know, there's community members outside here. The drum is, you know, just sounding behind me right now. Yeah, seeing uh, some video of everybody heading in there now, lots of friends and family. Uh, on top of families and friends doing impact statements, uh, TR Manitobans were also allowed to contribute if they wanted. Uh, is that normal for these types of trials? Uh, Dennis, actually it's not, at least not when it comes to like murder trials and that stuff, you know, um, some research. Um, you know, in some child pornography cases, they do invite uh, the impacts it has on community. And then more in recent years here in Winnipeg, there was a fatality from a drunk driver in a small community. And, um, you know, they took some community impacts there. But as to like, you know, murder trials and that sort of thing, this is very, this is, this is not normal. Uh, just lastly here, TR, we'll let you get back in the courthouse. But uh, when is Chief Justice uh, Joyal expected to give his sentencing decision? So, Dennis, that's supposed to happen later this afternoon. I will have a full report for you um, on our evening newscast. You know, we were told in court that we would hear probably about 12 public, 10 or 12 public statements, uh, where there's many others that, you know, people asked for them to be private. Thanks, TR. Appreciate all your reporting on this. Take care down there. Thanks. Now, if you're affected by the ongoing coverage of this trial or the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls issue, the 24-7 MMIWG support line is available. That number is 1-844-413-6649. The first person in the Yukon to be charged with manslaughter and a drug-related death has been sentenced. Sarah Connors has the details on the man charged and the victim's life sadly cut short in what could be a precedent-setting ruling. 34-year-old Jared Skookum received a manslaughter sentence of two years less a day and the death of Casca Klinkett woman Stephanie Pye. 36-year-old Pai was a member of the Liard First Nation. She died from an overdose after buying opioids from Skookum in April 2022. Skookum, who has a lengthy criminal record, was charged with manslaughter in 2023. 
He pleaded guilty to supplying Pai with the drugs earlier this year. The Crown and Defense asked for a joint submission, which they called unique due to a number of mitigating factors. That includes Skookum's fetal alcohol spectrum disorder diagnosis, showing remorse for his role in Pai's death and his admission of guilt. With time accounted for spent in pre-trial custody, Skookum's sentence has been served, though he's currently back in jail for unrelated charges. Following his release, he's subject to three years of probation, as well as a DNA order and a 10-year weapons ban. I spoke with the sister of Stephanie Pye. She called the sentence a slap on the wrist. She says the justice system ultimately failed her sister and that three children have been left without a mother. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. Time is running out for the Quebec government to comply with a federal emergency order for it to put forward a plan to protect endangered woodland caribou in the north central part of the province. For years, local First Nations have been calling for such a strategy, and now the provincial government only has a few weeks left to comply. APTN's Fraser Needham has that story. Speaking to the Environment Committee earlier this week in French, Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief for Quebec and Labrador, Ghislaine Picard, said caribou face extinction because of a declining habitat due to logging. For that reason, Indigenous communities support the emergency order. The government of Quebec persists in excluding First Nations from all decision-making related to caribou. Faced with its refusal to cooperate, the First Nations called on the federal government to intervene in accordance with its legal obligation. Minister Guilbeault was the only one to take our concerns and propose solutions seriously. In June, Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guibo recommended Cabinet adopt emergency decree to protect woodland caribou. Quebec has until September 15th to meet the order, but Sacre-Cœur Mayor Lise Boulian said implementing the order would be devastating to her community and could impact up to 70% of its residents if local forestry company Bois Echo were to close its doors. It's nearly impossible to anticipate all of the devastating impacts, unthinkable to foresee all of the consequences of such a disaster following the decision by the federal government. How can we imagine everybody getting up one morning without any idea of what their future could look like? Boise Echo, President Steve St. Gelais, agreed meeting the order would have big economic consequences. If this order is adopted, 600 direct jobs will disappear and it will be the loss of $200 million in annual benefits for our sector. That is unthinkable. The Bloc Quebec Wine Conservative parties are also against the move. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Now a follow-up to a story last month about Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand being charged for fishing without a license. He has stood firm that he was not in the wrong. Chartrand was ticketed by a conservation officer in June when he was angling in a lake outside of the recognized Métis Harvesting Rights area near the town of Cranberry Portage. The area's boundaries throughout Manitoba were set by the province in 2012. However, in 2018, an expansion was proposed that stretches to the town 700 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg. As reported by the Canadian press, the Crown has decided to stay the proceedings against Chartrand Deputy Natural Resources Minister Dana Rudy says there is currently no enforcement against Métis harvesters in proposed expansion areas. Nearby Nisichewayasik Cree Nation have expressed a disapproval of Métis harvesting rights within their traditional territory without their consent. Time for us to step aside for a quick break, but stick around, there's much more to come. Welcome back. A concert was held this past weekend in the Yukon community of Carmax to raise awareness about the recent Eagle Gold Mine disaster. The concert featured a selection of local bands as well as headliners like Snotty Nose Res Kids and Love and the 38. 
In late June, Victoria Gold's Eagle Gold Mine experienced what's been called a heap leach failure, allowing cyanide and other contaminants to be released into the surrounding environment. The concert was organized by the Little Salmon Carmack's First Nation in solidarity with the, Nia Na with the Nacho Nyactan First Nation, whose territories were affected by the incident. Organizers say around 260 people were on hand for the entertainment and to learn more about banning heap leaching. Dozens of student rocket teams are showcasing their engineering and teamwork skills in Northern Ontario this week. And organizers say interest in the event is out of this world. It's the second year on Metagamy First Nation territory and an Indigenous youth team is participating for the first time. CTV's Sergio Arangio has that story. Three, two, one. An explosive event that has people's eyes on the skies and is giving dozens of rocket enthusiasts the chance to launch their mind-blowing ideas into the stratosphere. Oh my God. Around 50 university rocketry teams are blasting off on Canadian soil for the third year and it's attracting students from across the country. We were hoping to test like uh, our aerodynamic capabilities. So we're going to try to to use this knowledge for a higher launch eventually. Shooting for the moon is the goal here with rockets capable of reaching up to 30,000 feet in the air. Organizers say the event is drawing more teams and spectators every year. One of the coolest things this year is just the level of support we've been getting with the local community. Um, the event keeps growing and uh, and so does the support that keeps us coming back here. The competition is even getting international interest but he doesn't want to fly too close to the sun. Its second year in Metogamy First Nation territory, an Indigenous youth team is lifting off for the first time. There's exposure to a lot of excellence in this area, so that's an opportunity for us to participate in something that's really wonderful. It's one small step for our students, but one giant step for Metogamy First Nation because we're making history today. Next year, we're hoping to get our students licenses so that they can shoot off the next class of rockets. A Toronto high school student and rocket fanatic who has volunteered here in the past is now competing with her own team. I'm trying to get rocket in the air. It's competitive, but it's friendly. It's community. Everyone works together, and I knew I wanted to be a part of it. I go to an all-girls school, and I decided I really wanted to push to inspire girls in STEM. Whether it's emulating aerospace companies they hope to work for one day, making Canadian history, conducting research for the space industry, or even just having fun, the event aims to give youth of all backgrounds a launch pad for big dreams and giant leaps. Sergio Rangio, CTV News, Timmins. Holy, those are deadly rockets. I thought they were going to be like Roman candle size. That's a cool story. Good stuff out there. Uh, well, as we've been telling you about a decision by Regina City Council not to change the name of a street named after one of the men who helped set up the residential school system is being criticized. We'll speak with someone who's been pushing for the name change for almost a decade after the break. Welcome back. Here's a look at your current conditions. Sunny and 22 in Fredericton, 21 in Halifax. 18 for Kujuak and Nain at this hour. Sunny and 22 in Montreal. Sun's out in 21 in Val d'Or. Sunny and 23 in Sault Ste. Marie, 22 in North Bay. 20 in Thunder Bay. Showers and 22 in Sioux Lookout. 22 for Thompson and God's Lake. 19 and rain in the Paw. Showers and 26 in Winnipeg. 24 with rain in Dauphin. Showers and 22 in Regina. Rain and 21 in Saskatoon. 21 in Uranium City and Meadow Lake. Over in Northern Alberta, 21 in High Level. 22 in Fort Chippewan. Showers and 15 in Edmonton. 13 with rain in Lethbridge. 19 in Vancouver. Sun's out and 22 in Kamloops. 19 in Prince George, 21 in Smithers. 18 with rain in Old Crow, cloudy and 16 in Whitehorse. Sunny and 20 in Yellowknife, rain and 19 in Norman Wells. 10 and cloudy in Saks Harbor, 16 in Politak. 
18 in Chesterfield, 21 in Arviat, 2 with snow in Resolute, 4 in Aglulic. Last week, Regina City Council voted not to rename Dudney Avenue, the street named after Edgar Dudney, a man who helped set up Canada's reserve and residential school system during the late 1800s. He also used starvation as a tactic against Indigenous peoples. The vote came after a lengthy meeting at City Hall last week, with the name change shot down by a vote of 7-3. to three. Here's some of the reaction from a city councillor and Regina's mayor last week. I would call it an explicit endorsement of Edgar Dudney, who was a terrible person. We're not even at the truth stage of truth and reconciliation yet. And my view is this was quite an easy win. Fundamentally, I think that I can't get there into renaming a street thinking that that's going to solve problems. I don't think it's going to. I think if you invest in youth programs or you, I don't know, knock down burnt out properties, that's a way better spend of money, I think, in terms of uplifting and having an impact on how people feel about their city. Jolie Big Eagle Kikwautawe, the co-founder of Buffalo People Arts Institute, has been calling for the name change for the last eight years. She recently spoke to Creason to tell us more about the city's decision. Jolie, thank you for chatting with us. How are you feeling about the city of Regina's decision to not change the name of Dudney Avenue? You know, um, I was really disappointed to hear the news. Um, I felt that, uh, you know, some of the proponents for the name change that spoke at the city council meeting in June were all for the change and they spoke really good on why the change was needed. Um, there was no real, I think, reason for the vote to be against. I heard that there, the funds, um, the expenses weren't as high as Mayor Masters and some of the others had said it might be. Um, I think there was a, a chance for for the, the group to come together. I know there's been some division within council and I thought this was a great opportunity for the council to come together and vote in, in as one voice for a good reason. Can you explain the support you have gathered over the years to change the street name? So initially, I think that the biggest supporter has been a group called Decolonizing Relations who are about right, wanting to right wrongs. They're a small group of, um, of women here in Regina. And from there, we, we started a, um, a letter writing support campaign. We got over 600 signatures on the petition. Then we have a change.org that has over 3,000 signatures. We submitted that to the old mayor in, in 2020. And then we also got a, a motion from the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations last May, uh, unanimously supporting the name change, not just changing Dudney, but changing it to Tatanka Avenue. We have a letter of support from the Reconciliation Regina, we even have UNIFOR, the UNIFOR Union, they put forth a, a, a motion in support of it. The Office of Treaty Commissioner supported it. Yeah. So we have this, this wide-ranging support. You talked about it a bit there, Jolie, but Regina Mayor Sandra Masters has said she saw figures as high as two million for the name change because of how many businesses and residents live on that long stretch of street. Do you agree with Mayor Masters that the money could be better spent on other critical needs? You know, I think um, uh, last week when the city manager, you know, said, you know what, actually we could do the signs in-house. It's not going to be, ne it's going to be negligent to the residences um, and maybe the businesses will cost $100 for the change to land title. I don't think it's going to be in the millions. Um, you know, I think that a lot of it can be done in kind within the organizations, you know, kind of federal to provincial level. So. You know, I, one of the things I had asked for was a cost-benefit analysis. You know, how does the cost outweigh, you know, anything regarding social economic um, cost, right? Like, how how is this going to benefit Indigenous people versus, you know, a cost to the city? You know, because what is the cost of reconciliation? Yeah, no, that's a good point to make. What do you want people to know about Edgar Dudney and, and what type of person he was? 
You know, in my research, um, you know, I, I approach this in terms of what could our city do in terms of truth and reconciliation. So I started this campaign in November 2016, and, and finding out about Edgar Dudney and, and his legacy that he's left, he was, you know, an opportunist. He, he named the street after himself. He bought land here in Regina. He, he forced the, the federal government to, to relocate, or the provincial government at the time, to relocate the capital city to where it is right now from another place because he had land here. But I think the thing that sticks out the most is he was one of the architects of residential school. He purposely starved, you know, my ancestors, our ancestors, great great grandparents. He was responsible for providing rations to them, and he purposely withheld food from them to starve them out, so that so that they could die. He wanted people to die to take the land. That's ultimately what he he wanted. He had the means, he had the money, he had the food, but he purposely starved Indigenous people. And, and they died, you know? So why would you want to honor someone like that now, now that we know this? And it's by his own memos, by his own handwriting that he, he was uh, really evident in, in what he did. Yeah. Really quickly here, Jolie, what's next for you in this fight? So for me, I, th I think what really I find lacking is if you Google Edgar Dooney, or if you just do a quick search on the internet, Everything that pops up is really um, a glowing review. I think we need more of an educational campaign. We need more people to come forward and, and write books, write stories, create videos, YouTube videos, TikTok. We need that information out there so our young people know, our voters know, and, and, and people just, you know, because the length of Dudney Avenue goes from the only street in Regina that goes the whole length and is the heart of the Regina. Does Dudney rep really represent the heart of Regina? You know, so I think we want to create some some more educational campaign, and if we have to, maybe raise the funds to if there's any costs, right? I'm, I'm not. I'm in this for the long run. We're not stopping. Well, Jolie, Big Eagle, quite a way. Uh, thank you for ta chatting with us today, and uh, wish you all the best on your journey ahead here. Thank you, Creason. Take care. Well, that is all the time we have for your first look at the day's news. For much more, including the latest on the sentencing today of a Winnipeg serial killer, you can go to our website, aptnnews.ca. You can also follow along with live updates by following the APTN News Twitter or X account. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for being with us. I'll see you back here in a couple of hours. Have a great afternoon. An explosive event that has people's...